What is the meaning of life? Why are you alive? Why are you here? Why do you work all day? Why do you sleep? Why do you eat? Why were you born? What will happen to you? That's the kind of question we're talking about on this program at this time each day. And uh, what we've been saying is that the only way you can get any kind of a sensible answer to that question is if you somehow can discover what the purpose uh, was when the world was al uh, originally made. And, of course, if it was just a result of time plus chance and is just a result of a, an explosion somewhere in the universe, then you can't hope that there'll be any meaning in it at all because we can see no meaning in the bombs that explode. They create nothing but destruction and chaos. And so if that's what caused this universe to come into existence, then there is no point in life and there's no purpose and there is no reason to it at all. And yet one of the difficulties with that view is that there does seem to be so much reason and so much order and so much design in the universe. We've only to look at the way the planets orbit each other year after year, century after century, without colliding, to see that there is some great order in the way the planets move in space. We can see also that there is tremendous design evident in our body, in the blood circulation, in the way the heart works, the way the brain works. And so it seems to us that there is reason and there is order and there is design and there is evidence of planning and intellectual purpose in the whole universe. And so we have come to the same conclusion as Einstein that there has to be a personal intellect behind this universe. Of course, what we've been discussing is whether this personal intellect has ever communicated with us or not. In other words, whether we have ever had a visit from outer space. And what we've been saying is that even though all the great religious leaders like Buddha and Muhammad and Confucius and Zoroaster claim to be able to tell us what is behind the universe and what the Creator had in mind, yet they all died like ordinary human beings. There is only one person who did not die like an ordinary human being. There's only one person who seems to have been able to leave the earth for a period of 40 days, go out beyond where even our space shots go, and come back and tell us what the creator of the universe actually is like and what he had in mind when he made the whole universe and what he had in mind when he made you. And that man is, of course, the man called Jesus. And what we've been talking about is the very reliable evidence that we have that he existed historical evidence that is more reliable than any of similar period uh, in those days. And that evidence is, of course, found in the New Testament. And it's that evidence that we have been discussing. We talked, first of all, about how we could trust the men that wrote that uh, history and how they themselves have made an impression of integrity and honesty upon our world, how they, in fact, died for what they wrote which argues for believing them, and how what they wrote is corroborated by non-biblical writers like Tacitus and Tertullian and Porphyry and Celsus and Pliny and Josephus. And so the question that we have been discussing over the past few days is, well, let's accept then that what they wrote was what they actually saw, and therefore it is historically correct. Do we have what they wrote? That's the question. Do we have what they wrote? After all, it was written, you say, 2,000 years ago. Now, this is 2,000 years later. How can we be sure that somebody did not change it all in the meantime? And what we have been sharing is that that is a charge that all the classical authors uh, are open to because we've been studying a few, like Plato's Republic, uh, which we all regard as absolutely reliable. We believe that when we read Plato's Republic, we re read what he actually wrote, even though he wrote it in 400 BC, even though he wrote it uh, almost 2,400 years ago. We believe that what we have in our copies of Plato's Republic is what he actually wrote. It's the same with most of the other classical writings. Caesar's Gallic Wars was written by Caesar 
somewhere between 144 BC, somewhere around, say, 80 BC. Yet the earliest manuscript we have of Caesar's Gallic Wars is dated 900 AD. In other words, there was a period of a thousand years between the earliest manuscript that we have of Caesar's Gallic Wars and the original manuscript that Caesar himself wrote. And yet we do not question that when we read Caesar's Gallic Wars, we're reading what he actually wrote. Now, perhaps you say, well, maybe there is a great deal of manuscript evidence. Maybe it is late evidence, but maybe there is a great deal of it. Do you know how many manuscripts, ancient manuscripts, that is, manuscripts as old as 1000 AD, how many manuscripts we have for Plato's Republic? We have seven. Do you know how many we have for Caesar's Gallic Wars? We have ten. In other words, we believe that what we have in our hands in the present copies of Caesar's Gallic Wars and Plato's Republic, what we have in our hands is exactly the manuscript that Caesar and Plato originally wrote, in spite of the fact that the earliest manuscript we have is actually a thousand years later than when they wrote the original manuscript, and we have only seven to ten such manuscripts. In other words, we believe that we have ostensibly the manuscript that was originally produced by the author, even though we have only from seven to ten manuscripts, and some of them are as old as a thousand years after the manuscript was originally written by the author. It's the same with all the other writers. Tacitus's history was written about 100 AD. The earliest manuscript we have is 1100 AD. That's a thousand years. We do have 19 other manuscripts of that, 20 of them altogether. When we go to Pliny, we have seven manuscripts, and the oldest one is 850 AD. That is 750 years after Pliny wrote his manuscript. It's the same with Lucretius. He died in 55 or 53 BC. Yet we believe that the writings that we have of his are what he actually wrote, in spite of the fact that we only have two manuscripts, and the earliest one is 1,100 years after Lucretius wrote his manuscript. Aristotle is the same. He wrote his writings somewhere between 384 and 322 BC. The earliest manuscript we have is dated 1100 AD. That is 1400 years after Aristotle wrote his manuscript. We have a manuscript. And we have four others like that. We have five altogether. This is the kind of manuscript evidence we have for the classical writers. What kind of manuscript evidence have we for the New Testament? Do we have seven ancient manuscripts of the New Testament? Do we have ten? Do we have fifteen? Do we have twenty like Tacitus? Do we have ten like Caesar? Do we have seven like Pliny? Eight like Thucydides? Eight like Suetonius? Two like Lucretius? Nine like Euripides? Five like Aristotle? We have four thousand ancient manuscripts of the New Testament. 4,000 ancient Greek manuscripts of the New Testament to convince us that what we are reading in the New Testament is what the eyewitnesses originally wrote in the first century. What about the age of those manuscripts? Let's look at that startling information tomorrow.